Welcome to BCS, the Chartered Institute for IT. We're talking about the Internet of Things, taking it from hype uh, to something that is useful. Uh, there are extreme views about the Internet of Things. Uh, the more wide-eyed technology fans think it's going to answer many, many problems, uh, from health uh, through to how we drive our cars and so on. Uh, those of a more nervous disposition are worried about privacy and security, which is also an understandable position to take. Uh, the BCS shortly are going to provide a, uh, a position statement on uh, a considered view of the Internet of Things. Uh, first of all, though, we're going to uh, have a debate with some people that are experts in the area. Uh, so who we have here is Andy Stanford Clark, who is a, a distinguished IBM engineer. We have uh, Alex deschamps Sina, who's the founder of Goodnight Lab, so someone that already has a, an Internet of Things product. And we have uh, Paul Excel, who's uh, the chair of the BCS Entrepreneurs Group. So uh, thank you for uh, joining me today. I'd just like to kick off. What are the benefits we're seeing from the IoT right now? Um, well, the, the, the real thing the Internet of Things is bringing us is visibility of the world outside. Um, so we can find out what's happening, whether it's part of the industry or monitoring people or monitoring cows in a field or vehicles in the street. Um, find out what they're doing, bring that data back to some place, uh, do some data mining analytics on it, get what we call actionable insights, i.e. Uh, work out what to do as a consequence of knowing that, and then either tell somebody or send a signal back the other way to make something happen, maybe turn a light off or turn a thermostat up or uh, make the traffic lights go red or whatever. So people probably mostly come across this sort of thing, uh, perhaps as smart meters in their homes at uh, this stage, would that be a fair comment? What other things might people have noticed actually happening in society? I, th I think that uh, perhaps they will have been thinking about buying a wearable device mm -hmm. in order to reach that exercise goal or health goal. And I think that that's another very consumer facing um, side of the same technologies that has, I think, inherited less um, uh, controversy perhaps than yeah. smart meters. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, what are we going to see on the horizon in the very near future that's really going to bring these things to people's minds in, in terms of concern? What, what's just around the corner? Well, I think you're going to see a, a lot of um, stuff in the, uh, certainly uh, from my perspective, around the, the whole e-health and, and uh, that kind of stuff, picking up other themes on, on wearables. Um, there's going to be a, a lot of uh, innovation in that whole consumer space to try and bring you know value add there um, and also you know health benefits uh, I suppose it, in my head um, the, the issues are around you get some benefits if if um, something is monitoring your your heart or some of the, one of your loved ones heart diabetic situation whatever it might be mm. uh, society gets some benefits because hopefully it means you get a better quality health service which is affordable to wh whoever has to pay and, and that's important if we're uh, if we want to take society forward. But then, I suppose, also in my head, I, I want um, the privacy uh, to be to be fixed. So yeah. you know, I want someone to tell me if, if my heart's got a regular rhythm uh, so I can get, get it treated or get it sorted out. But I don't necessarily want data like that to be put out to all and sundry, and, uh, which could clearly be misused in, in a number of forms. So I think, to me, in one sort of vertical sector just there is, is both the pros and cons, potentially massive benefits to, to a health service or a health provider, the individual, but also real concerns around the, the security and privacy that you might have for, for that particular collection of data. Okay, we'll, we'll pick up on the concerns shortly. Andy, Andy. Um, I think the biggest thing on the horizon is the exciting and scary combination of us not knowing what's coming next. It's the huge diversification of Internet of Things devices mm. we're seeing at the moment, uh, certainly almost anything goes. <laughs> you know, people are trying out things like you know, internet toothbrushes and things like that. The world will decide whether we need one of those or not, uh, and, but we have to get those smart products into market in some form for us to work out what the internet of things really is and what things actually bring genuine consumer benefit and you know, genuinely bring advantages to the world. And along the way, when things come to market which perhaps scare a few people, that runs the risk of giving the Internet of Things a bad name. Like, oh, we've got these things now. That's what the Internet of Things is all about. Well, that's just one example of all these other things which are bringing tremendous good. So I think the really exciting thing, I'm putting a very positive spin on this because that's how I see it, <laughs> yes. um, is that we've got so many things coming and people are really just getting their teeth into the fact that you can rapidly prototype 
a product using Arduinos and Raspberry Pi type platforms um, and software using cloud hosting technology and Node-RED and various things to lash things together to get things working quickly and see if they fly. And that's really the really cool thing at the moment. Will an IoT toothbrush report back on a, a sort of geographical map of Tata build up or something like that? Is that uh, it's certainly one of the possibilities? The sort of yeah. <laughs> I don't know what might benefit from that, but I suppose there could be some societal benefit. I think the idea was to train people in how to brush properly. Are you brushing oh, okay. for long enough and up and down and all the sides and everything? Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about the uh, health project that IBM have been doing in Italy? Yeah, so we worked a couple of years ago on a project in Bolzano, in northern Italy, so it's called the Bolzano Project, which is <laughs> aptly named, uh, and the idea was to monitor people in sheltered housing, mm. um, and it was to allow the warden to keep an eye on the people who are his residents, and um, obviously it wasn't to replace going to see them, because obviously that happens on a daily basis anyway, but it's really to prioritise who might need attention sooner than other people. So the monitors in the homes were monitoring things like energy use to look for um, at what point in the day they had their first cup of tea, or if they used the cooker to cook some lunch and how long they did that for. Um, we monitored uh, moisture levels in the kitchen to see if they're cooking um, a piece of toast or some pasta, which had very different moisture profiles. Yes. Um, things like um, whether they went in certain rooms, if there was water flowing in the house, um, either onto the floor or through pipes, and so toilet flushes and using the shower and things like that, just to build up a profile of what a normal activity looked like. Mm. We also included things like carbon monoxide and smoke sensors as well to give an emergency alert. Um, and the idea was to look at normal operation to see what most people's profile looked like. So for example, had they had a cup of tea before 10 o'clock in the morning, um, if they hadn't, it might not be a problem, they might just have a cold drink or maybe they slept in that day or went out for a walk or something, but it's just an indication to the warden to say, well, maybe I'll just pop in on Mrs. Smith first. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't be Mrs. Smith in Italy, obviously. But <laughs> and the, the, so the, acid, the, the test was, uh, at the end of the year's trial, um, all the residents were asked, would they like to keep this technology or did they see it as intrusive? And 80% of them wanted to keep it. So that was uh, a really good um, endorsement of the fact that of the extra care, not only from the warden, but also their families were also able to tap into the system to, uh, to keep an eye on their, their ageing loved ones. So that's actually developed into an actual product now, I believe. Uh, so that was just a pilot, yes. um, and the actual trial has now ended. But we're now working with a company in the UK called Current Cost, that's now branched into um, a new um, venture called Current Care, which is essentially using extending the Current Cost sensor platform to add things like um, door and window opening and toilet flush sensors and so on, mm. to run into a, an IBM cloud-based rules engine which says, uh, has had, Dad had a cup of tea yet by 10 o'clock? If not, send me a text. Or maybe various other scenarios you can kind of encode into mm. it. Um, and that effectively gives that same sort of level of uh, remotely keeping an eye on one of your aging parents. You've got some excellent uh, practical applications there, aren't there? And now we're not here to talk about products necessarily, but Alex, obviously you were involved actually with the product as well. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the operation of the Goodnight Lamp? Of course, so the Goodnight Lamp is a family of internet connected lamps. You have a big lamp and a little lamp. So you give the little lamps away to anyone around the world and when you turn the big lamp on, the little one turns on which makes no sense unless you have a family member in a different time zone who's always calling you at some odd hour and you just want to let them know that now's a good time to call, you're available right now, or actually a loved one who might be elderly and living on their own. And so even if they just use the lamp to read before going to bed, you can tell they're around, they're okay. Um, and there's a connection there that's established that's very ambient. The lamp is made up of uh, wood and plastic. These are sort of you know, friendlier materials than what you might find is sold to the aging market. Um, and it's something that is essentially built up on top of a platform developed by SI, which is an M2M provider in Guildford. And so we're using M2M technologies because people don't necessarily have grandmothers with Wi-Fi at home. Um, they also have families around the world and they don't want to create um, that kind of uh, remote IT support that you might have at 1 a.m. Uh, and so it's really taking advantage of connectivity in a very small way. We're turning lights on and off. We're not, you know, this isn't rocket science, but in a context that feels friendlier and more, um, uh, more reassuring than sort of 
a quick call that doesn't work out and, oh, I'm not around right now, can I call you later, and then never calls later. Um, there's a lot of, uh, in our global world, I think, opportunities there for something simple. Um, and I think to just to, to continue on to Andy's point, I think the biggest opportunity for the Internet of Things is actually filling the void in the, um, in the design industry largely, which has ignored the elderly market. Um, if you're a young designer emerging into the scene, the last thing you want to do is develop things for older people. Um, and actually that's a real mistake because there's a lot of opportunities there. The cost to the NHS of people living alone on their own is extreme. And so providing people with platforms they do want to buy into um, and that are ambient because they're hidden inside objects they already know, uh, that connectivity now is so cheap, it's so accessible that um, we're really hopefully going to see a lot of value there. And it's not sexy. It's, it doesn't necessarily make for fantastic PR and compared to a internet connected toothbrush, you know, um, it's, it's less sort of um, hypey, but I think that really is where the opportunities are. And healthcare more, you know, sort of um, concentrated healthcare opportunities inside hospitals and inside, you know, monitoring of people and glucose levels and these things will sort yeah, of emerge. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's really where one of the biggest opportunities for IoT lies. Okay. Yeah, no, and I think just, just to build on that also, you think of the energy savings for people. I mean, energy is often one of the biggest domestic bills, if not the biggest. So just very, very simple stuff. This isn't rocket science. Just enabling you to take 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever it is, percent out of your energy bill by just use of you know, smart, uh, smart metering, uh, smart technology, um, also safety around boilers, those kinds of things. There's a whole bunch of really interesting, I think, from a, you know, a, a reduction of accidents viewpoint, the lifestyle uh, improvement, uh, cost of healthcare. Again, sort of thinking my own personal experience, my, my father who sadly passed away now, but had died type uh, 2 diabetes. He was forced, well forced, uh, you know, he had great treatment, but he had to travel 40 miles to a hospital to have his blood tested on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Now that's bad for him, he's trying to run a business, it's bad for the hospital because they have to chew up, you know, appointment times, it's bad for the environment because he's going to drive 80 miles, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. You do that, you know, remotely, um, on a regular basis, the treatments improve, you know, the cost of the healthcare is dramatically reduced the, the environment. So you can, kind of, you can get, although cliched, sort of triple whammies. I think there's also, you look at, we've, we've focused a lot on, on domestic, but of course there's lots of opportunity in industrial environments where you can, uh, you can get the whole, uh, providing again, uh, you, you get things think through the design safely, you can, you can run plants more efficiently mm -hmm. at much lower cost and um, you know, more, uh, much safer, so you can reduce actions or even fatalities. Um, um, I was at the BCS entrepreneurs uh, judging on, on Friday and you know, as a, a safety, a building safety um, solution there, just using internet things to, to make uh, safety on, on a building site uh, a really major part, you know, saving lives, saving accidents, that kind of stuff. It, it, so, so there's a whole range I think also in the industrial space as well as the, the consumer space which have been, uh, been well talked about here. This is very much something we're seeing, I mean 20 years ago um, our clients were asking us, you know, we've heard about this thing called the internet and the web, what should our web strategy be? This year, now, they're starting to say, we've heard about this thing called the internet of things, what should our, mm. our, our IoT strategy be? And the, the, the short answer is, find the places in your, uh, your business where in, you've got um, shadows in your information picture, where you don't know where stuff's happening. It might be touch points with customers, it might be uh, places in your supply chain where you don't know where your pallet of boxes is from, at some point during its journey. It might be some machine which is critical to the operation but you don't know whether it's running fast or slow or about to break down. And you can use data from Internet of Things sensors to link in with lots of other dimensions of data, whether it's up the supply chain or out to the consumers or linking with other data like weather data to predict sales or um, predictive failure analysis to decide if a machine that was previously working well is going to start breaking down and eventually fail within three or four weeks. That can really make huge differences to people's, uh, to companies' operations and save lots of, mo lots of money and make them more efficient and provide a better service to their customers. If I can just uh, step in to, for controversy's sake. Please do. Um, 
I think the really interesting challenge is to treat the Internet of Things as not the intranet of things. So for people to build up proprietary systems, proprietary software that they then, you know, that's just business as usual in an industrial context. Um, intranet, meaning there's an openness there and there's a capability there for consumers and end consumer, whoever the end consumer of a particular product is, to engage back with the company to potentially build value on top of someone's data. So I think of a shipping provider, for example, the fact that I can see that the van is coming to my house at the slowest of speed should also allow me to say, actually just drop it off at this post office. And, you know, let's just, let me interact with the systems that you have, let me interact with uh, what you've already got there because you might find that actually you can cut on time for your driver to get to me because there's a massive you know, a tree fell down the road and they'll never get there anyway and I know this and you know this but there's a lack of exchange right now between someone who's providing me a smart service and myself as a consumer who has access to a lot of that information but it's an information that's sort of a dashboard at the minute um, you know, you're showing me something I have no control over. And I think that exchange and that openness is very much what the web was built on, These, the values at least of the web. Um, and I think that's a, it's a business challenge, um, but I think it's one worth addressing because I think a lot of value could be taken um, and, and built yeah. on top of that. For sure, and I think you have to start with the question, I mean, the Internet of Things, it has got, you know, we were talking earlier about it being the top of the gut and the hype, so, so, you know, so I could run mm. now. There's a lot of hype about it. It's just, for me, being an old guy with grey hair, just another technology. I mean, mm. it, and think of, think, I was trying to think in perhaps a cliche way, what, what information would you like to know? What, what would you really... Um, need to run your business more effectively or you know make your life better and so on and to the point that's been that was made uh, by Alex it's not just that's you know internal to your, your own sort of zone it's being able to pull together those end-to-end -end bits and pieces so you, you can create um, you know, something more than just a, you know a siloed mentality I think you're seeing a lot of that that there's, there's lots and lots of business and, and consumer silos the great opportunity I think is to get that end-to-end -end consumer or business experience uh, and allow frankly innovators um, and their imagination to, to come up with better ways of you know, running the world, delivering healthcare, um, you know, homes, those mm. kinds of things. Well, that's interesting. I think we're just edging towards a little bit of a discussion about some of the technical underpinnings and the standards that are going to be involved here. I and mean, we just recently, ARM released a, a, a kind of Internet Things operating system, uh, a kind of thing. It is the underlying infrastructure of the existing Internet and, and the web that sits on it actually up to the job of in the next few years having a massive billions of uh, connected devices and coping with that situation. You might not want to discuss a technical question, yes. but... Yeah. <laughs> Short answer, yes. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So people talk a lot about IPv6, yes. um, which I've been on IPv4 at the moment, and there isn't going to be an IPv5, so the next one's IPv6. Um, and as long as you don't think that that's, a pred that's you know, necessary before the Internet of Things can happen, that's okay because the Internet of Things is happening and there are far more things connected to the Internet now than there are IP addresses in the 32-bit um, range of IPv4. So we've got that, that wasn't a limiting factor. However, having um, universal addressability on an IP network, and I think more to the point, IP to the edge is, is really the benefit that IPv6 brings. So it's not so much IPv6 as an addressing scheme, it's more things like 6 low PAN, which allow you to take very low energy packets of, over radio right to the edge. So there's very small sensors that are off most of the time and occasionally you wake up and talk. With IPv6 and IP to the edge, yes. we won't have the problem that yes. we'll start with our small pilot now, but then when it gets really big and successful, say, let's say you're a I don't know, vacuum cleaner manufacturer, say, supposing it gets wildly successful and suddenly every vacuum cleaner on the planet gets an IP address mm. and starts sending data back about the vacuum cleaner bag's full and, uh, <laughs> um, and so on, uh, then scaling up to those massive numbers won't be a problem. Right, okay, yeah, okay, that's interesting. 